It's well. It's good to have you all back. I hope you're doing well, Cody. What's up? Is it time for our breaking news? <laughs> the list is long. Well, let's hit it. Let's get started. Breaking news. Breaking news. Breaking news. The public school system said the quiet part out loud. Okay. What did they say? They're afraid that not have that because they're not going to be in class and they have to have these Zoom meetings this year because people who educate students aren't smart enough to read graphs, um, so they canceled school and they don't know how to read statistics. But I digress. Um, so they decided because COVID-19 is so dangerous, they're going to not have school, even though for kids it's not that dangerous. And so the, the part that they're afraid of is that parents are now going to um, s- hear this teachers brainwash their children. So what, what are the actual words that they say? Because that's just the Those, That's Cody's commentary. So let's see. Let's be fair as we can. Okay. What are they actually saying? So this is a guy named Matthew K. is okay. his name, an educator and an author of a book on how to lead meaningful race conversations in the classroom. He's, He's probably wo- not woke at all. He, no. He's worried that conservative parents would be able to interfere in the messy work of indoctrinating children into critical race theory, gender theory, and other left-wing dogmas. Okay, so thank you. Yeah, that's even worse than what you said. <laughs> <clears throat> so he, this, this educator is worried that he's going, because kids are staying home with their parents more, that his attempts at indoctrination into leftist worldviews mm-hmm. is going to be harder because they're going to be com- he's going to be competing with the children's actual parents. Mm-hmm. You're right. They said the some, quiet part out loud. Some of the teachers didn't even call them parents. You know what they called them? What? They're caretakers. Well, some of them do have caretakers, I guess. Yes. But I know what they mean. But they, they don't mean... <laughs> yeah, you're right. Some of them do just have... But so here's his, I think, like the whole thing. So this fall, virtual class discussion will have many potential spectators. Parents, siblings, in the same room. We'll never be quite sure who is overhearing the discourse. What does this do for equity and inclusion work? How much have students depended on the somewhat secure barriers of our physical classrooms to encourage vulnerability? I'm just going to say time out, and I'm (laughs) going to say something here. All right? I'm going to say something. This is a confession Mm. from a public educator that they purposely seek to indoctrinate your children with things they do not want you to know about. Mm -hmm. If you've ever had any good reason to get your kids out of that system, that's it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, I don't know, where is this? It didn't say. Or is he just, just talking in general? It was in. It was on Twitter, so there was no real like. There was no. All right. There was no places given. How many of us have installed some version of "What happens here stays here" to help this uh, encourage? Like what? Voter. I wonder what things he means. Yeah. Do you think two plus two equaling four is what happens here stays here, or do you think? Oh, Billy, well, you well, feel like you're a girl? You can I'm be so a girl glad that here. you brought up the 2 plus 2 equals 4 because we're going to talk about how 2 plus 2 uh-huh. does not equal 4 anymore. Well, com- well, conversations about race are in my wheelhouse. My wheelhouse because apparently He's parents, an expert. Yeah, parents can't talk about race. And actually, he doesn't even really talk about race, but he thinks he does. And remain a concern in this no-walls environment. I'm most intrigued by the damage... The damage that helicopter slash snowplow parents can do in the host uh, conversations about gender and sexuality. What does he mean by helicopter and snowplow? Parents? Well, I don't know what he means by snowplow, but I think I know what he means by helicopter. Just you know, hovering the, over yeah, the just to kind of. I think he. Here's what my definition of helicopter parents would be: the ones that are over the top, over 
like go beyond the the scale of what God would tell us as discipline, train, watch, shepherd your children. What he means by helicopter parents is a parent doing any sort of anybody parenting. Anybody that cares. Like anybody. Yeah. And while conservative parents are my chief concern. Of course. I know that damage can come from the left too. If we are engaged in the messy work of destabilizing a, child, a kid's racism, homophobia, or transphobia, how much do we want their classmates, parents, piling on. That's right, because every conservative parent and every conservative kid just hates gay people, hates transgender people, and hates people of a different race, right? That yep. is ridiculous. Like, this is what's being thrown at our children in environments like this. All the same stuff. It's like they got this list of bullet points, mm -hmm. and they just, every day, they're beating those things to death. Mm -hmm. Just cramming them in their heads, just over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And uh, looks. Well, what's happened is the society has said that the authority for the child is not the parent, unless the parent lines up with a certain set of ideological views about the world and how things and humanity. If you line up there, then you can be an authority. So what they so now it's gone further. The authority is the idea. And anybody who's against that idea, that worldview, those sets of doctrines, is then can't or is not qualified to be the authority over those children. And actually some would say are practicing child abuse. But here's the thing with him, he's taking his stuff. He, not only does he not want the parents to be the authority, he doesn't even want them to be in on the conversation. Yeah. So that they could later say, hey, what your teacher said was wrong. Mm -hmm. Like he, he wants parents completely out of the picture. Mm -hmm. Or caretakers. Yeah. He wants them completely out of the picture. So it's, it's, it's even a step further. Yeah, you're not the authority, but you don't understand. I don't even want you in the room. While I'm teaching your kids these things, mm -hmm. this is a, this is a ninth grade teacher that shared similar viewpoints as this. That she asked her students to read and respond to news articles as part of a class, but that participation in this exercise is stunted now because of outsiders listening. The outsiders, to be clear, are the children's parents. A teacher with pronouns listed in her Twitter handle said. <laughs> that she plans to use the chat function more than voice lectures because she wants children to share information with her in a parentless way. A science teacher agreed with all the sentiments expressed here and summarized it bluntly. Parents are dangerous. But their leftist, depraved worldview that they're trying to is not indoctrinate dangerous. our kids with isn't. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. I just can't deal with it, man. I just can't. <laughs> it's it's so absurd that I can't even take them seriously. I know they're serious. I know that they're saying what they really desire and mm -hmm. what they really want. And and I would probably it, it'd believe? probably be safe to say that like this I, I this is a a smaller majority I think right now than. In some places, it's it's a very small majority. In other places, I'm sure it's the the majority um, of people, the yeah. large majority of people in the public school system. Um, Matt Walsh makes a great point here that actually what this borders on is like a child predator. And here's why he says that. Because it's an adult telling a child, well, we'll keep this a little secret right. between you and She's me. She's talking about private chats and everything mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, it when you turn the responsibility of parenting over to a group of people that hate your views, your worldview, 
this is what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. So, um, anyway, need to be, if you have to send your kid to public school, by have to, I mean, there's nothing, I mean, you're a single parent, you have to work, there's nothing else you can do, what do you do? You know, I mean, I'm talking about that, I'm not talking about you think you have to because both parents have to work so that you can be materialistic. But I'm talking about you really have to send your kid to school. You have to be all the more vigilant to know what's going on, what's being taught, what's being said, and so on and so forth in order to um, protect your kids from guys that think that uh, you're dangerous yeah, and you're, gonna I mean, get, you're getting in the way. When it's a dangerous, it's a scary place when you have educators publicly coming out in droves, even though they may still be the minority, but they're coming out in droves and they believe that parents are dangerous for their own children. That's yeah. a scary place. Yeah, and I would say that um, I, want to, I would just tell Matthew K. that he's dangerous. Yeah. You're dangerous. You're dangerous to my kids and to other people's kids. You're the danger because you're you want me to listen to you. You're the same person that tells my son he can be a girl. Yeah. And you claim to be an educated human being. You're a fool. Yeah. You have no educate. You're an I mean, I'll go as far as say you are an idiot. I mean, I mean that in the most in the real sense. in the realest sense. Because you're you're telling me that basic biology is now all of a sudden not the case. And not only that, but people that that go through this gender change, whatever you want to call it, you can't. They are, they most of them end up extremely depressed, and many even suicidal. You can't change your gender. <laughs> yeah. I, and, and what you can happens, change physical aspects about you. You cannot change your gender. And that's what leads to suicide and depression later on. After, so let's talk about who's really dangerous here, Matt K. Yeah. What is this? I mean, why do they all look like that? I'm sorry. Why? I mean, because they're hipsters. One, this next one, that's not hipster look. That is like. So we have a math teacher. Who tells us... Math professor. Professor. In a college. The smart one. She doesn't know that 2 plus 2 equals 4 anymore. Yeah. Because math is now in no way objective. And to say that it's objective is a myth. And it actually reeks of white supremacist patriarchy. It's white people's fault. This is from a Twitter feed. The idea from Lori, what's her last name? Rub Rubel? Rubel? I don't know where she's from. Portland? <laughs> They're all from Portland. Seattle? Gosh, that was my state, home state, Washington, just <laughs> too far. The idea that math or data is culturally neutral or in any way objective is a myth. I'm ready to move on with the understand with that understanding. Who's coming with me? All right, time out. Along with hold on, All along right. with the, with the of course math is neutral because two plus two equals four. I I just can't with these people. We have to, this, that math is pure. Math, math, we should protect math. She says, this reeks of white supremacist patriarchy. I'd rather think on nutrient. <laughs> what is this, this is going on here? Like, I'm laughing, but I'm broken inside. And protecting the, pl some of this stuff doesn't even make, you can't even read it. First of all. Well, it's Twitter language for one. Yeah, I don't know that. So, anyways. The basic thing is, 
she is telling us that it is no longer the objective reality and truth that 2 plus 2 equals 4. That math is not pure. That math is not a, an objective reality and truth. Okay, so let me just... I'm going to be nice for a second. Because she's being consistent. Mm -hmm. Why is she being consistent? Well, because she rejects God. Mm -hmm. She suppresses the truth about God in her unrighteousness, right? She says, she claims He does not exist. Right? So, if that's true in her worldview that God does not exist, then there really is no objectivity to math. Mm -hmm. There really is no certain mm -hmm. in this world. Um, have you ever watched that Jason Lyle uh, video on fractals? Mm -hmm. Do you know what a fractal is? No. It's just a series of numbers that are always constant. Okay. And, you know, math is an objective reality. Anyway, that's all what, mm. that's what fractals point to. Well, the, the existence of math and the existence of certainty demands a precondition, right? And that precondition is God. Mm. There, she's right. If there's no God, 2 plus 2 doesn't really equal 4. You can make it equal whatever you want. There is no right and wrong, okay? What's funny, though, and this is where she's inconsistent, She's consistent in the fact that if there is no God, there is no objective truth. Mm -hmm. But she's making truth claims when she goes on these Twitter rants. Right. And so... By the way, you, don't send your kid to Brooklyn College. Is that where she's from? Yes. Okay. She's a math professor at Brooklyn College. Hey, man. Or said they'll probably get an A. Just write down on there whatever. whatever you want. Just don't write the right answer. Correct answer. It's just... This okay. is... This Can is, I just tell you something? Again, this is my rant. This is my rant. They hate Western culture because it's white culture to them. This is what, they, this is what they've said. Okay, right? It's math happened, math progressed. That's white supremacy. Yeah. These godly people with their math yeah. and their objective truths. Because she says it, she says it reeks because people in the West understand objective truth. She says that's white supremacy. Here, G.K. Chesterton, you know who that is, right? Yeah. He said this a long time ago. We shall soon be in a world in which a man may be howled down for saying that two and two make four, in which people will persecute the heresy of calling a triangle a three sided figure and hang a man for, for a maddening mob with the news that grass is green. Mm -hmm. And he's exactly, he was exactly right. Postmodernism comes from a rejection of an ultimate lawgiver. Mm -hmm. When you reject an ultimate lawgiver and a, and a standard for objective truth and all this, you're reduced to postmodernism where mm -hmm. nothing is certain at all mm -hmm. in this life. And you don't even know that your claim that nothing is certain can actually be certain. To be consistent, you would have to say, well, yeah, I understand I'm making a truth claim here while believing that there is no truth. Mm -hmm. So it, it always comes back down to you can choose God or absurdity. There's no in-between. So here's my, um, my thing. Being an idiot is now applauded as being brave and courageous. Well, well, yeah. This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. This is a professor. I didn't even go to college. Okay? Went to college for like a year. I'm like, I'm out. played ping pong the yeah. whole time. <laughs> and I barely made it to class in high school. I typically was always in some other class I wasn't supposed to be in. And yet, I'm not so dumb that I get on Twitter and go, you know, math, object, not objective, math is racist. racist. Yeah. yeah. This is this. These are people that are gonna. People like this shouldn't be allowed to vote. They certainly shouldn't be able to keep their jobs as a 
college professor. This is the type of person that's going to decide what goes on in the country. Well, I think Trump should win the votes because how do we know the math's right? Right. We can. There is hey, no objective. What? Yeah. It doesn't matter who gets the more votes. Yes. Because it's not. It's not objective. Who cares if Biden wins all the if electoral? Biden, if Biden gets all the votes, conservatives just say, "Hey, voting is racist." Yes. Therefore, we're going to keep Trump. No, but see, race. then it's no longer racist. Oh, because it worked out in their favor. It worked out in their favor. Guys, I don't know. I mean, let's try to be more serious here for a second. This is the inevitable outcome of suppressing truth in our unrighteousness. So, the example that I have been given the last 48 hours, because I'm a football fan, I mean, I like college football, um, like, no I'm one, so over sports. No one rolls know. their eyes when the CA is like, I'm a bass fisherman. Bass fishing. I'm just kidding. So, you have, they profess to be wise, they've become fools. Fools, right? This is what we're seeing. This is, the yeah. professor, supposed to be wise, foolish. Educator in the school system, professing to be wise, foolish. Yep. Another example. College football, for example. They're talking about they're going to cancel the season. Okay, I'll move on. It's hunting season. I'll go hunting. I'll spend my time with my family on Saturday and not watch a game or whatever. I'll do something else. However, these are people who are in charge of major universities and major, um, what do you call them, conferences of, of several yeah, universities. Yeah. yeah, they're in charge of all this stuff, right? So, they should be smart. They apparently cannot read s statistics and graphs statistics. Yeah, that show that the age group of the college students that are going to be the athletes in, this, in these sports that happen in the fall have almost a 0% chance of dying from this disease. But we're canceling it. Got, can't have it. Mm -hmm. Out of a fear? No, I don't think it's fear. I think it's political posturing. Yes. And then everyone caves to it. Yeah. But the, reason, the only reason I bring that up is this. We're talking about people who are claiming... To be wise. Yeah. We're talking about the higher, educated, authoritative people who are in charge of major things who are so dumb that they make these type of claims and these type of decisions based on what? Not feelings. facts. It's all feelings. Yeah. And so it's a it's it is we're watching what sin does to people. It's irrational, it's illogical, and it makes you dumb. And that's what we're watching. Yep. We're watching people who claim to be wise are fools, are behaving, acting, and speaking like fools. That's all we're watching. It's just in we always think that it's gonna the Romans one thing is 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 like these heinous things, and it is. It does yeah. happen with these heinous. But we can also see it in all these little, yeah. you know, canceling college football is not a heinous thing. If we never had it again, life would go on, right? But we can see decision-making. If, if no one goes to Brooklyn College, I'm not going to be sad. <laughs> but we can just look at these things and go, Romans 1, yeah. they're being given over. So that's what we got. That's what we got. That's it. That's the news for the day. There could be more. Oh, there's definitely more. All right. Well, let's let's get into the scriptures a little bit. Where there is maybe we can finish objective one truth. Now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where are we beginning? Verse twenty-two. Yes, twenty-two. First Peter. First Peter. Chapter one. Verse this 22. is truth. 
Yes. In the Bible, 2 plus 2 does equal 4. In the world, 2 plus 2 really equals 4. Yeah. Even though there's some that... But, but see, what I'm saying is the, the world is going to start telling us it's not, so we have to run to our Bibles and say, no, it really still is 2 plus 2 <laughs> equals 4. <laughs> oh, man. So. All right, verse 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding Word of God. Again, the Holy Spirit inspired these men to pin this, and all of them are consistent in this. Your living, holy, and obedient, and pure, comes from what Christ has done in you, through what He's done for you. Always. I said it this way on Sunday. The gospel of grace does not lower the standard of holiness. It actually raises the bar of holiness. It elevates it. Um, it doesn't lower it. And you have here, what does it say? You've purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. You love your brothers. You love one another from a pure heart. Why? Since you've been born again. Because of your new birth that comes about by the finished work of Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit, this is how you behave. Yeah. You were once dead in your sin, um, alienated from God like the rest of mankind, but mm -hmm. God breathed life into you through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. You have placed your faith in that live like this. It's systematic. Mm -hmm. This is where you were. This is what God has done. Because this is what God has done, live this way. It's not complicated. Mm -hmm. It's not. <laughs> you don't live that way in order to become something. I think Piper said it best. The Christian life is just this Continual, gradual becoming who you are. Because you are a new creation. And then the, the rest of your life is lived out in, in that becoming a reality, in that becoming um, coming to fruition. Yeah. Um, and so you're not producing fruit in order to become righteous, but because the righteousness of Christ has been given to you, you live out your practical righteousness. Yeah. And you have no righteousness of Christ if there is no practical righteousness. You're saying if you're not bearing fruit... Yeah, you I'm not saying that. Not, the Bible you know. says that. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's, it's, it's what Christ says. You will bear fruit. It's not a matter of like... And some are going to bear a lot, and some are going to bear um, a little. A little, but there's going to be fruit. Yeah, yeah. Um, then he goes on. So he says, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincerely for a sincere brotherly love, let love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. Like our being born again cannot, we cannot be born again and then someday be not born again. Mm -hmm. It is impossible. It is imperishable. Mm -hmm. You can't have eternal life in Christ, meaning I have forever life in Christ, eternal, and then not have eternal life mm -hmm. in Christ. That is, that's a contradiction. It's impossible. And here's what's happened in our in the Bible Belt. We've reduced having eternal life. To a very, to a very, to a religious activity of walk an aisle, say a prayer, 
ask Jesus in your heart, do some religious activity, then you have eternal life. Saved, always saved. Yes, so then after that, then they cling to the right doctrine. Right? It's like they, they have a faulty understanding of this new birth, but yet they have the right understanding of the perseverance of the saints, and they cling to this perseverance of the saints without understanding the, the idea of regeneration. So then you've got a bunch of people that the guy, he, oh, he's in heaven. I watched him get saved in this church 25 years ago. He never bore any fruit or anything. He never he, came back he to church. He never came back, but he said a prayer one time. And we believe once saved, always saved. Yes. Right? That's the problem. That's the problem because... It, the foundation's faulty. Right. It is true that when Christians are saved, mm -hmm. they will persevere to the end. It is true that once you're saved, you will always be saved. But here's the problem. We assume that everybody that walks an aisle and says a prayer is saved, mm -hmm. and they're not. You are saved. We assume that everybody that's a church member is saved. Yeah. You are saved by true repentance, turning from sin and death and mm -hmm. turning to Christ in faith. And if you have truly done that, your life will reflect that reality. Yeah. The, that doesn't mean you're perfect. No. I mean, look the, at Cody. Yeah. But Exactly. The worst is... You have church members. Here's the hardest thing. We then have made it even, we've reduced fruit to, well, they come to church. Yeah. They bring their Bibles. They live a pretty good moral life. You know, they don't murder anybody, commit adultery. They don't do drugs. You know, they vote Republican. I mean, we, we've, we've, We've reduced the works and the fruit down to some things that anybody can do. A lost carnal man could do those things. And we assume that those people are too born again. No, there's character. There's Christ-likeness. Here, the, he uses brotherly love. Real, sacrificial love for the brethren. So, and I want to point out this to you, because... We don't talk about these things to have anybody uh, doubt having assurance or anything like that, right? We do have assurance. The Bible tells us, First John, that you may know. Mm -hmm. I write these things so, you may, so that you may know. People that are have truly been born again, we do have assurance of this. Right? We don't have to worry. Like, yeah, I'm going to stumble every day, but by the grace of Christ, He's going to keep me. And, and you know what? Ten years from now, I'm going to be more like Christ-like than I am today because that's what He's promised to do, the sanctifying work of the Spirit. So we don't harp on these things to make anybody doubt their salvation if it's sincere. But what we do is, because I believe this is what the Scripture is telling us to do, we need to examine ourselves constantly. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. S make sure that you are walking with Christ throughout this life. Mm -hmm. And these are some of the evidences um, that come out if you are doing that. Mm -hmm. there, there ha there's a brotherly love. There's a love for God's people. That love comes out in serving God's people in real, tangible ways. It comes out in bearing their burdens. It comes out in true biblical fellowship. Love one another does not mean you buy them groceries. It might mean you buy them groceries. It also might mean that you rebuke them for a sin because you love them. You know? Um, and so, again, it all comes back to you cannot take a biblical phrase and then define it yourself. You can't take We're not born again. To do that. No. You can't take born again and say, this but, is what it means. You Cody, can't take fruit and say, this is what it means. You can't say love. We live in a modern world. And 2 plus 2 doesn't equal 4. Right, so... But that's what I said at the beginning. We're at the Bible now, and 2 plus 2 does equal 4. <laughs> yeah. And so you have to say, okay, this is telling me if I'm born again and I'm to love my brother, what does the Bible teach about loving your brother? And then that's what this looks like. Not, what we've done is, well, loving our brother looks... This way, okay. Well, some of those things may be true, but it's not. But sometimes it's not complete. Yeah. 
Um, and so you have to take the scriptures. And what does it what does it mean by the new birth? What does it mean by love for one another? Not what what do you mean by that? So, um, it this, goes into this. Uh, are yeah, you done with that part? Yeah, I'm, I think I'm done. <laughs> it goes into this little part. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls. But the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Mm. So, why, why did he go there after? Because he, he tells us about this, we're born again by the living and abiding word of God. Um, and then he tells us something about that, about that word that it remains forever, and this word is the good news that was preached to you. Um, there's lots of things that could be said there. One, uh, the word of God is not some dry historical book to appease your curiosity. It is a living, breathing, the word of God. When the Bible is being read, when the Bible is being properly taught, it is God speaking. It's not the man speaking, it's God literally speaking to you. He, God, God is saying, because you're born again, love one another. He's saying that. Right. The God of the universe, with all authority, is saying that thing. So when you read the scriptures, this is my issue that I sometimes have, that you might, you'll probably disagree with me. I didn't warn you about this. You mean we don't agree on everything? No. I think sometimes when we do a show like this, people assume we agree on everything. Right, right. The over, the hyper exegeting, proper hermeneutic, expositional preaching, we've reacted where people were telling story, it was story time during the Bible preaching, and they weren't doing enough of the Bible, and then we've, we go all the way to the other side to where it, it's so formulated, it's so, it's so do all of this, and I think you shared a story, I'm not here to pick on you, but this was the story that you shared, that you'd written thing out, and the, and the professor had said like, yeah. hey, this was exegeted great, yeah. so but there's no application. Yeah, so I, let's... So anyways. Here's what Cody's saying. In our, our I'm not saying hermeneutics is bad. Right. No, he's not <laughs> saying hermeneutics is bad. He's not saying expository preaching no. is bad or exegeting the text is bad. We should do that. As preachers, that's our primary mm. job is to do those things. Mm -hmm. But here's an example of what I think you're talking about. What It was my preaching class. Mm. I had to write a manuscript sermon mm. I don't even remember what passage it was, do you? No. Anyway. It's your story. Yeah. <laughs> so I wrote out this sermon, and I'm talking about I broke down every word mm -hmm. of the passage mm -hmm. and what it meant and all this stuff. Like, as far as exegeting the Scripture, even the professor is like, this is the best one I've, I've received mm -hmm. since I started this class. And I'm not saying that to boast because he, he comes back. Mm -hmm. He says, but there's zero application. You use no illustrations. Mm -hmm. And I, I was honest with him. I said, look, man, I, I'm, I grew up where I sat in church and the preacher read one verse. Then he talked about whatever he wanted to talk about that for to do 20 with or the 30 verse. minutes. Yeah. It has nothing to do with the verse right. he read. And then at the end, gave an invitation and then that we all went on with our weeks, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so what I do now, the reason I exposit and exegeted like that is because that's a, that's a pushing back against what sure. I grew up hearing. Sure. Because all there was... And much of that is proper and know, right. Yeah, all I heard was illustration after mm -hmm. illustration mm -hmm. after illustration. It had nothing to do with the text. Mm -hmm. And so, anyway. And so, I just bring that up to say... It's because, and I bring that up, and my pushback to that kind of specific preaching is God's 
book is alive. And if we exegete it to death, right. where there is no life. I'm not talking about, don't be preaching things that aren't here. Don't be preaching things that aren't in the text. Yeah. Preach the things that are in the text. Talk about the things that are in the text. But is there life? And I'm not meaning you have to have life. I'm much more, I talk with my hands, I get loud, I'm, I'm more energetic than some. That doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Jazz hands. Yes, exactly. But what I'm saying is this book is alive. Give it to the people in a way that is 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 doing justice to the text, but is not ch- just choking it to where there's no application, there's no life given to it. A good sermon has proper exegesis, proper exposition, proper teaching, and proper application, and usually some conviction that comes from the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. Right? A good sermon has all of those things. Right. Right? It's not a good sermon if you have, you know, you read the passage and there's no mm-hmm. exegesis whatsoever. You said you have eyes to Jesus, which you just want to say whatever you want to say. And it's also not a good sermon if you're just... If there's no application and no, like you said, it's not living, breathing. What does this mean for me today? I mean, I hear you, preacher. I mean, I, I agree with what you're saying here. It's straight out of the Bible, but what does that mean for me today? People need to know what this means for them today. Yeah, and it and you don't give them what it means to them today and it not be what the text means. Right. You have to apply the text I try to think of who am I speaking to? I have mothers, I have children, I have fathers, I have men who go out and work and labor every day. How does this apply to them? How can I put this text in their lap and say, this is for you in the middle of the day and so on and so forth. So, and then the last thing I'd say is he ends it with, it was preached to you. It was not taught. There is a difference between preaching and teaching. Good preaching has teaching in it. It it does. But not all teaching is preaching. No. There is the word preached authoritatively. Um, There is things that supernaturally happen in the preaching of God's word. Um, When God's hands upon a man and God's using him. And it says this is the good news that was preached to you. It comes in the power of the Holy Spirit. It comes with full conviction. So and so. Sounds good, Cody. So just remember until next time, two plus two does still equal four. Always will. You are the You're not crazy. Safest teachers for your children. Mm-hmm. Um hey, giving that you're not crazy. You're, yeah. Uh, you yeah. Know, you know. And you are the one that uh, God has given those kids to. Amen. So don't forget that. Amen. Cody? Now we just pray that uh, the rest of your day and week will be uh, glorifying to God and whatever you find yourself doing, whether you're eating, drinking, whatever, that you do it all to the glory of God. All right. So.